So hopefully everyone's had a chance to swing by the Rapids booth out there. Um, if not, swing by later on, then we can do kind of a, a really deep dive into the area that you're interested in. Um, all of my slides are available online, so you don't have to worry about, you know, taking pictures of them or trying to quickly go through and figure out, you know, the, the pertinent information. It's actually all on our Rapids website. So rapids.ai will take you to our website. Uh, under Docs, Overview, you can actually download the full slide deck and start looking at it. I'm not going to do all the slides that are in there. There's like 70 some slides and I don't have that much time. So, but everything's out there. Every release we produce a new slide deck uh, so you can go back and look at things. Uh, also, you can check out all of our documentation. Um, everything you want is available on our website including all of the stuff of how to get Rapids, how to install it. Um, getting started will take you to a page where you can figure out if you want Conda install, Docker, you know, click all the boxes, it will give you the magic code to copy and paste into your browser or into a command line. So with that said, let me dive into pretty much a little bit of history and then we'll get into Rapids. So big data has been around for a while. Um, if you can't tell by my gray hair, I've been doing this for a while. Uh, I was actually doing it back before there was the term big data. Uh, we called it data warehousing, very large databases. Just, you know, I have a ton of data type problems, uh, federated databases. And then came along Hadoop. And this was great because then I could just throw everything into a giant lake, query it. I didn't have to worry about, well, so have to worry about schemas, but you didn't have to worry about them as much. Uh, the problem was it was slow. Um, I guess at the time when it first came out, we considered it fast because we were working on even slower systems, but it still took hours to do queries. Uh, and it would go out, run a piece of the query, save temporary results. Next thing would read those temporary results which was great because it gave you fault tolerance. You didn't have to spend a lot of money on your machines. Uh, and then came Spark. Uh, and when Spark first came out, I was amazed at how fast it was compared to Hadoop. Uh, it loaded everything in memory. It still took hours to run queries. Um, and at NVIDIA, we sat around saying, okay, this is cool. Let's start accelerating it because I want things faster. Um, and years ago, all we would do was really focus on accelerating an analytic. So let's take XGBoost and make that fast. Um, the problem is we realized that it wasn't solving our problem because it didn't address the full end to end. It just shifted where the bottleneck was. Um, so accelerating different analytics caused this problem that we were still doing a lots of writes. Uh, within the GPU realm, moving data in and off the GPU is kind of one of the most costly processes you can do. It takes a while to move it because you're limited by PCI bandwidth or however it's connected bandwidth. So we really want to get rid of the step of having to copy data every time. We wanted all of our applications to be able to share the same data, uh, just pass pointers around. And luckily, along came Apache Arrow to find this nice Columnar store. We said, hey, if all of our stuff adheres to Columnar store, I can now run kind of my ETL and I'll just give the machine learning folks a pointer to that data. They know the format. I don't have to copy it, don't have to convert it, move it off the GPU, back onto the GPU. Life will be great. Uh, and following that approach, we've now gotten down to, you know, 100x faster than where we were over Spark, which was 100x faster over Hadoop. Life is great. We can actually start doing things at Reasonable speeds, right? Um, I did a lot of Spark stuff, uh, and I would say, okay, here's a cool model. I would code it up, I would hit run, and about 10 minutes of waiting, I would start thinking, you know, if I did that model differently, I would get this answer, and I would start coding up the new model, and by the time the one model finished running, I'm like, I can't remember what I was doing there. Let me just start this new one and see what that is, and it just led to just repeating things over and over and not really being productive. So 
let's just jump into how fast Rapids really is. So this is an example where we were taking uh, mortgage data from Fannie Mae. So this is a collection of multiple years, 200 gigabytes of data on disk, which doesn't always translate to 200 gigabytes in memory because things explode and um, you can start converting formats. So we have to load the data. Um, even though it comes from Fannie Mae, for some reason they cannot spell bank names correctly. So we have to adjust all the bank names. Then we roll, do this 12 month rolling window over the data to look at how well mortgages are doing. Uh, and that produces three new columns. We then take those three columns, pass them into XGBoost, we train this model, and then we say, okay, for new mortgages, are they gonna fail, yes or no? Kind of the, the standard thing you would do, right? I'm assuming everyone in this room is a data scientist or understands data science and, and math. Um, so we wrote this all up. Uh, we coded it on 20 nodes, 30 nodes, 50 nodes, and 100 nodes of Spark. Uh, and then we also ran it on two of our larger uh, NVIDIA boxes. Uh, one was 16 GPUs and then five, eight GPU boxes. So as you can see, we'll just jump all the way to the other side here where even 100 node Spark is 3,221 seconds. Um, you know, that's plenty of amount of time to, you know, get up, go have lunch and come back and you finally get your answer. Um, we did it all in 213 seconds. So basically enough time to get up, go get a cup of coffee and come back to your desk and there's the answer. Our goal was to be able to load all the data and have your prediction faster than Spark could even finish loading it. Um, and, and we achieved that goal. So we were happy. This is kind of what, what type of performance you can get. Um, I've heard people kind of say, well, I really don't need performance. My model is set. I just train it every now and then and I give it out to customers. Uh, and I'd have to say that your competitors probably do care about performance. If you have a model out there that people are using uh, and I can iterate real fast and come up with a better model, uh, your model may not be kind of being used that much longer. Um, we also don't just sit around saying, okay, we did something, let's move on to the next problem. We constantly improve our code. So our goal is to make things as fast as possible. Um, we start off with saying, let's make it work first, uh, and then we slowly iterate. So over the past couple months, we've actually reduced a lot of these run times down. Um, and basically for you, you just use the code uh, the next release suddenly is, you know, another 10x faster and you just magically get the benefit of all this hard work that we're doing under the covers. Um, we have a lot of stuff coming up which should cut even these numbers right here in half. And again, performance is critical. Uh, and I'm borrowing some slides here. Um, you know, the fastest way to win at data science is speed, user, uh, experience, and really being able to iterate really, really fast. If I can try things at the speed of thought, I'm like, oh, let's see what this does, run it and get an answer, tweak it. I mean, you can now answer questions faster and better. Um, I worked with a customer where it would take us a week to come up with an answer, and whatever answer came out at the end of that week was what we went with because we didn't have time to do it again. <laughs> um, and then we've proved to the customer that their answer was totally wrong. Um, so <laughs> it's like, well, I know it's wrong, but I still have to go with it because I don't have another week because everything changes in time. So our goal is to make things fast. Uh, so let's dive into kind of the core rapids. So here's what the open system currently looks like. Uh, you do everything in pandas for all your basic ETL stuff, data loading. Uh, munging, cleansing, everything else. You then pass it over to Sidekick Learn for your machine learning applications. Uh, if you do any graph analytics, Network X is probably your favorite. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, then PyTorch, uh, and then a lot of visualization tools are out there also. Does that make sense? People see things that are right or wrong, or uh, and then you can use DAS for scalability. Um, we love all of these approaches and all of these APIs. 
So we said, we love the APIs. Let's keep the APIs, but totally redo everything else. So if you notice, kind of our kind of uh, library stack looks almost the same. We just have QDF instead of pandas. So if you know pandas, you can program in QDF. Um, your code, probably 90% of it won't have to change from what you have. You just change an import statement, it runs. Likewise, we have QML that adheres to everything scikit-learn does. Uh, Inria is probably is on our team and they advise us on stuff, so they look it over. Uh, QGraph, if you like Network X, we have the graph package, does everything in there. And of course, Dask, we're just stretching Dask over farther. Does everyone know about Dask? Who doesn't know about Dask? Everyone else. Uh, Matt Rockland was here the other day. You could have hit him up for all your Dask questions since he's leading the Dask effort. Dask allows you to scale your Python application across multiple nodes. So once, once it, you set a cluster up and you distribute stuff, basically you program as you were in Pandas. It has data frames. They're just distributed across things. Uh, so it allows us now to scale. I can write an application on one node and then easily expand that to 100 nodes, 1,000 nodes. Uh, I think there are customers going beyond 1,000 nodes. Uh, we love Dask, but Dask could use in some improvements. That's where UCX comes in, because Dask is based on doing TCP sockets, which we know are not the most performant. So UCX is now, uh, you can think of it as a topology-aware framework. So it knows how machines are connected and it will optimize communication for you. Uh, once it's integrated into Dask, you don't have to know about it at all. You just run the latest Dask and it will figure out what you have and run kind of, well, right now we're getting about 20x improvements just by going to UCX. We should have some real published benchmarks numbers coming up. Um, but this will now allow you to start, you know, you have your basic approach. Rapids is just the same thing, just faster. Likewise, you scale out with Dask. You'll now scale out with Rapids, Dask, and UCX, and you'll just get that much more performance. So my goal is to make this talk the most exciting and also boring because it's like, yeah, I know that already. <laughs> so QDF. Uh, the life of a data scientist. I used to sit next to the data science group on my old project, and I never saw them work. All I would see them do is sit around and talk about movies. They would type some stuff, and then they would just sit around for a half hour just goofing off. And I'm like, wow, I'm working my butt off, and they're just having fun. But yeah, you kick off a job, and you wait 20 minutes, and then it comes back, and you're like, oops, type something wrong, you try it again, and you just iterate that cycle. Now, since things run so fast, well, we're actually putting them to work. So companies are actually getting their money's worth out of a data scientist now because they're not drinking as much coffee or goofing off as much. And I didn't get to hear about movies anymore. Uh, data stack, Python layer. Uh, we use Cython to go from Python down to C. Uh, and then everything under the covers is really C++ and CUDA. Um, for the users, you don't have to know anything about GPU programming, anything about you know how it's parallelized and distributed, anything else. All you have to know is Python. And you just create a data frame and it's magically on the GPU. You type your command, you know, data frame.max or something to find it, and it just runs. Um, so it's all hidden from you. Unless you actually want to dive down into it, you're welcome to get the code add things to it, play with it. It's all open source. Um, if you break it, well, that's your fault. <laughs> so ETL is really the backbone of data science. I mean, I want to be able to read things in. Um, within Pandas, I think there's probably like 500 functions. There are a lot, and we are slowly working to get them all in there um, and maintain, you know, as accurate adherence to that API as we can. Um, 
So we're coming uh, for user-defined functions. We use Numba. It JIT compiles it down to something on the GPU. So you say, okay, you know, your library doesn't have this. I want to do this data conversion. I will write it, JIT compile it, and then I can now call it with inside my code. Again, how fast is it? Um, doing merges, joins, group buys. Uh, when you're doing data exploration, those are kind of the, the backbone. Well, maybe counting and averaging is really the backbone. It's where you always start with, you know, how many items do I have? Um, and it's odd that the bigger the data set, the faster speed up you get. With GPUs, we have lots of cores. More data just makes us happy. So 100 million rows doing the merge, 870x faster. So oh, that would be, you know, from 870 seconds down to one second to do a, a merge. Likewise for sorting and grouping. Uh, one of the things we really did also is focus on I.O. We don't want to have to read data elsewhere and then import it. We want to have all of our readers just suck the data right into the GPU and do everything on the GPU. So we have a CSV reader, Parquet reader, Orc reader, JSON, Avro. Uh, we have a whole list of things coming up. Basically, it just bulk loads data right off a file, right into the GPU, and then we do all of the col columnar identification, data type identification, everything on there. Um, as you can see, we are reading, this is 1.9 gigs uh, in Pandas and in the, the QDF one. So 29 seconds versus 2.3 seconds. Um, if you want to make it faster, specify the number of columns and the data types of the columns, and then we don't have to do that, and then you're suddenly cutting that down to, you know, one second. Uh, we are working very hard to improve that, so probably by summertime, those numbers will be cut in half, uh, depending on your machine. If you have, you know, your box connected up to storage on a slow thing someplace else, uh, this really won't help you. <laughs> We also found out that a lot of real world data is strings. Uh, people really never did strings on GPUs just because they are odd sizes and you never know how much data to allocate. But we created an entire string library. So you can load all your strings in there. Eventually we'll have full regex. Um, pretty much everything you want. I'd like to do a lot of you know sediment analysis and other things in strings and they're slowly working towards that. But again, you can do, well, two lower, two upper, fine, split, you know, uh, substring extraction. Everything you want is now on the GPU, accelerated and fast. Machine learning. Um, how many people here do machine learning? Like machine learning? Wow. Traditionally, what you would have, you would have a ton of data. You would do some type of dimensional reduction, figure out your feature set. Um, you do some iteration, cross-validation of it, and then you sample down. You say, okay, now I have my sample size. Now I can run my machine learning on it. Um, there was a talk at our GTC DC conference last month uh, where some folks from Capital One said this was their approach. But now with GPUs and Rapids, they can actually process all the data just as fast. So, you know, why do you have to sample anymore? Just take it all, spread it out across a lot of GPUs, run your machine learning algorithm, get your answers, and uh, it helps because you can do better prediction in the same amount of time. Uh, actually, it was faster than the, uh, the amount of time they were spending with the sampled version. The stack looks very much the same, Python, Cython, down to all the algorithms. Um, building a, a primitives library, once that primitives library is fast, it allows other developers to build new algorithms just using those primitives. So if you want to do matrix multiplies, there's that function. You can just tie it into other things and new algorithms will just pop out a lot faster. Um, then there's DAS ties into it, NumPy. 
So a large collection of algorithms and more to come. Um, I think UMAP's up there and did everyone go to the UMAP talk? No. Um, yeah, we're getting a lot of good success from UMAP. But, you know, random forest decision trees. Um, I still like decision trees because they're, they're easy to understand when you see the answers like, okay, I figure out, I can see how you got here versus some of the kind of deep learning approaches where like an answer pops out. I, I don't know how I got here. Here's an answer. Um, K nearest neighbors, all your kind of PCA and dimensional, well, component analysis, Holt winner, if you're doing time series stuff. Um, there's a video out on YouTube. So we're working closely with Walmart. They want to predict uh, what stores need what product. So they're using Holt Winter and kind of Arima to look at the time series of stuff and then predict what's gonna be going on in the future so they can better plan truck routing. So there's a nice video where they explain everything a lot better than I do, but check it out. So here's a comparison of using dbscan in Python. Uh, so you, you load the data into a data frame, you call fit, you call predict, you get some nice pictures. Uh, and then if you wanna see how it's done in Rapids, only thing really changed is, you know, imported QML. So instead of scikit-learn, QML, and everything else looks exactly the same. That's what I mean by this can be a boring talk. Look, I changed five characters. <laughs> um, again, using this, you get some incredible speed ups. Um, depends on which analytic you're doing, how much data and all, but things just run fast. Uh, this is a, a partial view of the roadmap. Hopefully by March, everything will be running on multiple GPUs. Typically we start with making it work, making it work on a single GPU, and then we spanned out to having it work on multiple GPUs. It's actually a lot of complexity on getting things distributed past one node. Um, but our plan is to have all of that done and more by March when we hit version one. So KuGraph is our graph analytics process. Um, how many people do graph analytics or familiar with graph analytics? <laughs> um, so KuGraph, uh, again, incredible speeds. We can do about 500 million edges on a single GPU. Um, everything is v done via data frames. So you can create these large property graphs and data frames pass that right into the graph analytic. Um, since it does talk data frames, I can do things like take all my data, I can say, okay, now I want these columns to be my vertices IDs. I can come up with like page rank scores or other graph um, centrality scores, and then I can pass that data right into a machine learning algorithm. I don't have to convert back because I get a data frame in and I return a data frame and machine learning, all the QML stuff takes data frames. We all talk the same language, so now I can quickly build additional feature sets that I pass on to machine learning. Surprise, surprise, the stack looks the same, right? Python at the top. Python is, you know, we love Python. It's the first class citizen. Um, within Graph, there's a couple other large open source efforts going on that we are slowly bringing in together and kind of tying into this ecosystem. So uh, Graph Laws comes out of UC, well, Texas A&M. Uh, Hornet came out of Georgia Tech. We tie into Gunrock out of UC Davis. So if you were using one of these other products, eventually it's all gonna be rolled in there. So we're working with all those folks, make sure that happens. Uh, since I manage the Graph team, I kind of and more excited about this piece than the other ones. Um, Dante, who's sitting over there, is on the, the machine learning team. So if you have machine learning problems, questions, find him. <laughs> um, so we have a lot of clustering. Uh, graphs are great for, well, cyber for finding anomalies, 
recommendation systems, social network analysis, you know, predict which people you should connect with next on Facebook. Um, whole series of centrality measures, pathfinding. Um, you know, if you go to the airport and you want to do the traveling salesman problem of how many hops will it take to get from this airport to the next one in the cheapest amount of time. So breath for search and shortest path algorithms are out there. Uh, Network X is not known for performance. So it makes our numbers look incredibly good. We're fast, um, but we're comparing with something that's incredibly slow. So when I say it's now 32,000 X faster, <laughs> um, I have some benchmark codes that runs a lot of Network X stuff and I actually had to get rid of some files because I didn't want to wait six hours for them to finish. Um, so Louvain is this agglomerative clustering algorithm where it just iterates over and over looking for groupings of folks and then it says, okay, here's what's in the same group. Um, but we are getting significant speed ups. So PageRank, this is kind of the classic Google algorithm of you know, recommending websites to go to. It's based on the fact that popular websites have other popular websites that point to them. So popular people have popular friends. So it just iterates over, you know, my popularity is based on the popularity of my neighbor. So it's a strange iterative thing. So we took the high bench numbers. This came out of Intel. Um, so we created this data set up to 16 billion vertices. So this is 300 gigabytes of data. Uh, threw it in there, said, okay, how fast will our page rank run? Uh, we got it down to 31.8 seconds. Uh, most of that time is really going from a data frame into our matrix to run and then back out. Uh, we ran the same thing on a 100 node Spark cluster. Uh, this took 5,700 seconds, uh, so roughly 96 minutes versus half a minute. Now, those are also things that you notice when you now suddenly have free time to, to think about it, and unless you want to kick the job off and go to lunch. Um, I have had customers that say they like it slow because they could kick something off at night, and when they come in the morning, it would be ready, and they wouldn't really have to do anything else. Uh, again, our roadmap is to slowly work towards being, you know, multi-GPU everything. I do need to update this with a bunch of other algorithms. Uh, deep learning. Do people in here do deep learning as well? So we go through DL pack, uh, and what this allows us to do is you can have everything inside of Rapids and just pass those pointers off to pretty much anything. So you go through Chainer, you go out to PyTorch. Uh, we all speak the same language now, um, or we can just translate it into the right thing. Uh, Dante's talk later this afternoon will go into more depth than that. But you can now load your data into Rapids, do a lot of cleanup, prep, and then say, okay, it's ready, and just call your deep learning algorithm. You don't have to like write it back off the disk and then start up another program to do it. Um, we're also developing a lot of other libraries. So we have a, a spatial processing library. So if you have like road networks and you wanna say, here's a bounding box around this area, tell me everything in there. Um, any type of GIS work we're now supporting that. Uh, signal, signal processing. Basically, you know, uh, this comes really out of the, what is it, uh, free radio effort. And so basically, if you have signals, radar signals, FM signals, AM, whatever, you can start analyzing them beyond just doing an FFT. Um, and it also runs significantly faster than a SciPy signal. Uh, 
we have plans to expand that to do a lot more. Uh, we also have uh, Ku cross filter, um, data shaders, all visualization tools. Um, we have a quants thing coming on. We have a bunch of other efforts. So we're slowly expanding to cover the full gamut of libraries that you need to actually do your data science and display your answers. Uh, if you go by the Rapids booth, you'll notice that NVIDIA is not really, you know, mentioned too much there because we really want this to be an ecosystem and partner controlled thing. So we're doing a lot of the work, but we want people to contribute and use it and join in with us. Uh, so we have a lot of contributing partners. We have a lot of people adopting it. Um, a lot of open source efforts that we work with. We also have a bunch of projects that are building things on top of Rapids. Uh, Nucleo, Blazing SQL, Streams. These folks have kind of adopted it and they say, okay, I can now build big systems. Um, the Blazing DB folks I talk to all the time, so they have this large accelerated database. Uh, everything talks in data frames, so when you do a query, you can get back a data frame and just pass it into one of your algorithms. Uh, they can handle, you know, a petabyte database pretty easy. And if you're wondering about where to get Rapids, well, it's pretty much in every cloud system that's out there. Uh, Google, Azure, you know, Baidu, Alibaba. Um, well, Amazon SageMaker, so you can just start up a SageMaker instance. Easiest way to get it, Conda install. Um, or download a, a Docker file. So if you want to spin up like a AWS instance and then just put a Docker file out there. We have tutorials, blogs, walk through everything on our website. And kind of a quick peek back at the website where you just pick the boxes and it says, you know, here's the command to run to, to get things. Everything is open source. Everything is on GitHub. Just go out to our GitHub account, download repos, post issues, um, join in. You know, all our docs are out there. Um, we blog quite a bit about the code. So you just do a search for, you know, um, medium blogs, rapids, and find everything. Uh, or we have a YouTube channel also. You can find videos. Within our GitHub repo, we have two repos dedicated to Jupyter Notebooks that are samples of how to do everything. Uh, one of them is called Notebooks, which is just uh, one notebook per analytic. It just shows how to run that one analytic. Then we have Notebooks Contrib, which may not be the best name, but that's more end-to-end -end problems. So if I'm in financial, how do I solve this problem? And it goes over all the steps. Uh, like I said, there's lots of nice YouTube videos out there. This is showing Dask and scaling, and you get these nice Dask dashboards with pretty pictures. So please join in the conversation. Uh, we have lots of ways to get in touch with us from, you know, posting a GitHub issue. You can jump onto our kind of Google group things and just write a message, say, hey, this isn't working. Um, we love those things. We like to see people using it, asking questions, telling us what your pain point is and what you would like to see next in the, in the libraries. And you're also welcome to just say, hey, here's a feature. I would like to write it and just contribute it back. Um, and then it's the standard GitHub process. Just clone it, write it, do a PR, and we'll review it. And, and kind of it can be in the next release. So join in the movement, contact us, let us know what we can do. So with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. Hi there. Thanks for the talk. Um, did you say UCX was the thing of the Dask that was topo topology aware? Uh, so UCX is... You can think of it as an extension to MPI that's topology aware. Is it learning the topology of your network and then applying it, or 
How does it? Uh, well, I guess topology, I'm using it slightly different. It will say, yes, I know that you're on InfiniBand. I won't look at the entire network. I'll just say, okay, there are nicks in your machine that are InfiniBand. Okay. Or you're on Ethernet. Or, hey, you have NV-linked GPUs. Okay. So I've looked at the integration with Dask and uh, QDF, and it's it seems pretty seamless. You know, you just import it and you're off. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how to integrate with the deep learning side, uh, specifically PyTorch? Um, it seems a little bit more difficult to get into using the data loaders that you have. Right. Um, I may punt that one to Dante. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tying into um, so just how to, how to con using QDF seems pretty easy. Um, using the data loaders and the batch data loaders that I've seen seems a little bit more difficult of a, a learning curve and getting those in there. Maybe, I don't know, maybe we can t talk after, but like the, how would you suggest starting uh, in the deep learning space, um, dabbling with what you have there? So in general, uh, speaking about the deep learning space, um, my, my, my usual suggestion is that you have already an existing code base, particularly something like PyTorch, is to exploit the fact that we're very interoperable with PyTorch. So you, for example, can use our CSV reader and once your data is in memory, use Py PyTorch data loaders to train your deep, your deep neural network, for example. Uh, then uh, that said, we are still improving and I will talk about it in my talk later. So just a little add. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are still improving the, the, that interoperability with data loader in particular in many ways, not only in the QDF side, but also in the QML side. So you can have interoperability, for example, one of our target uses and that is very popular is people that have deep learning uh, workflows that have very complicated neural networks and want to visualize them, for example, with uh, UMAP. Uh, then you, you don't need to copy memory or anything. You just have your touch tensors, you give it to us, we just process them uh, without, without, without much fuss. But it will depend very much on what deep learning framework you're coming from and what um, what is your objective. Uh, if you want to have QDFs that are cleaning, it's going to be one type of approach. And if you, or you, if you want to have QML algorithms or QGraph algorithms, it's a different type of approach. Uh, we're still refining a lot of those interactions. Uh, that said, for deep learning, uh, there's not a rapid, there's not a formal like rapid deep learning component. We and, and I will mention that a lot more as well. Uh, the deep learning part of Rapids is actually PyTorch Chainer and all the other guys that we collaborate a lot with. Uh, it's, 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 we have classical machine learning, which was not there presently, but uh, the deep learning is more about helping you use what you already have and not reinventing the wheel, not yet another deep learning framework, essentially. And we can talk more offline if you want. So the answer is attend Dante's talk. Okay, awesome. Um, let's uh, thanks, Brad, again for the great talk. Let's give him another round of applause. applause.